Number 10, Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is a 1,400 foot long, three foot high prehistoric effigy located in Peebles, Ohio, United States. Serpent Mound was first reported via surveyors Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis and was featured in their Ancient Monuments of Mississippi book back in 1848. Looks just like a regular golf course, doesn't it? But underneath, it's perfectly placed and well preserved earth formations that were made by hand to align with something in the sky. The mound is the largest serpent effigy in the world. World. Yeah, big snake. The mound itself winds back and forth for more than 800 feet with its tail coiling in seven different areas. Tons of Clovis era spearheads have been found that indicate interaction with other groups of ancient humans along with the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Archaeologists believe that the mound's creation was influenced by two astronomical events. The light from the supernova Crab Nebula in 1054 and Halley's Comet in 1066. The mound is also located on an ancient meteorite impact location which makes things absolutely way scarier. In 2003, geologists from Ohio State University and Glasgow said the meteorite impact origin of the structure at Serpent Mound is the best evidence for its build and importance. Yeah, nothing crazy, just a mile long cosmically aligned serpent made out of rocks, made from prehistoric dudes who could barely work fire right on top of a huge impact location. Yeah. Something's fishy here. Number nine, the Terracotta Army. Hey, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure you hit us up with a like button or comment down below which discovery in ancient history has you laying awake at night. I know mine. Let me know, I'll check it out. The Terracotta Army, don't even get me started, was first discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers east of the Queen Emperor's Tomb Mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, reports mentioned pieces of the terracotta fragments found, roofing tiles, bits of brick, masonry, but when they discovered heads of clay bodies, yeah, the Chinese archeologists started to investigate and dig a little bit deeper. To this day, it remains the largest pottery group ever found on Earth. The Terracotta Army is a collection of sculptures depicting depicting the armies of the Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Apparently a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting him in the afterlife. 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Yeah. That's a lot of protection. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. I'm just getting Medusa vibes when I look at this, you know? Like, I'm not convinced the actual purpose of this operation. Like, was it a front? Were they once alive? Who knows, dude? This place is mysterious but cool. Number eight, the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an anomaly ancient computer that uses the cosmos to predict astronomical events. A group of sea sponge divers discovered the Antikythera shipwreck in early 1900 just off the island in Greece. Hence, the name. I find it funny that divers diving for something you wipe your butt with found an ancient computer just chilling down there. Something about that makes me laugh. Many think it's cursed too due to its first handlings. Apparently after its discovery, three of the divers who dove down died shortly after its find. 150 feet deep just off Point Glyphadia, the team retrieved millions in worth of bronze, marble, pottery, glassware, jewelry, coins, and of course, this ancient MacBook. This device is made entirely out of a single bronze sheet built within a wooden case about the size of a shoebox. Faces and cogs covered in Greek inscriptions indicating the device's astronomical calendar, purpose, use, basically everything we have on our iPhone right now within this wooden box 2,200 years ago. Yeah, again, collecting sea sponges to wipe our butts with and then just stumbling upon a computer. I don't know, someone's getting a raise, I'll say that. Number seven, the baker's wedding dress. Why is it in so many horror films the ghost is always a lady floating around in a white wedding dress? Mix it up a little, I don't know. Maybe a bridesmaid's gown wouldn't hurt. Maybe something red, something a little pizzazz on it, I don't know. Been watching a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race. Throw, throw, throw some glitter on something, I don't know. They're always taken out before their wedding night, it seems. Or apparently they're taken out over a vase. Back in 1849 in the small town of Atuna, Pennsylvania, Elliot Baker and his wife Hetty lived in the Baker Mansion. They had two sons, one daughter and a baker. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees, another steel worker, but her father wouldn't allow the relationship to really, you know, take off. Anna vowed to never marry again and she locked herself in her room. When her father passed away in 1848, she went to go find her true love, but he had since settled down. So she spent the rest of her days behaving erratically. You know, she was upset, rightfully so. Her father didn't let her have her true love. And now her soul still haunts that same wedding dress today. Not just the dress too, the mansion is haunted as well. And guests would report furniture and vases moving around all the time. That's not bad as far as hauntings go. You ask me, moving couches? That'd be great. I have a bad back. I would love some help. Really, thank you. Anna, grab the side. Let's go. One, two, three.
Number 6. The Oldest Map A 4,000 year old stone slab first discovered over a century ago in France may be the oldest known map in Europe according to a new study. The slab dates back to the early Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It was first discovered in 1900 in a prehistoric burial site in Finisterre, France. The engravings on the broken stone appear to resemble topographical features including hills, reference points and river networks. The broken slab, which is 4 meters long, was moved to a private museum in France in 1924. It was then stored in a French castle where it gathered dust until it was rediscovered in the castle cellar in 2014. But only recently are researchers beginning to understand the actual importance behind this prehistoric slab rock. It's been interpreted as the oldest cartographical map in Europe. Yeah, that's old. Number 5. Tattoos. Okay, so who was the first? We see them everywhere. I don't have any myself, but every which way you look, somebody's tatted head to toe. So who was the first one? Well, a mummy known as the Gablian Man A pushes evidence back about a thousand years. The oldest tattoos were once thought to belong to a South American Chinchoro mummy who had a mustache tattooed onto his face. It was initially thought that he was the oldest specimen of ink. Then an ancient princess was found in Siberia. She holds one of the most well-preserved tattoos ever found on a body. Princess Ukok, a Scythian ruler who sadly died of breast cancer around 3,000 years ago. Her body was inked up so heavily and she was buried next to six horses, indicating that she was of high, high royalty. But in 1991, the oldest mummy ever found still holds the Guinness World Record for the oldest tats. Like, 5,000 years old. Otzi the Iceman repped 61 tattoos over his entire body, mostly lines that researchers think was either medicinal or therapeutic. Several needles were tied together and the skin was pricked stick and poke style with ink made from wood smoke and milk. Mix them together, rub them all over the wounds and voila, Travis Barker. Number four, the Nazca Lines. The ancient, very mysterious geoglyphs that make up the soil of the Nazca Desert in Southern Peru is an old one. They were created, we think, somewhere between 1000 BCE and 500 AD. Basically, people would make impressions or shallow incisions on the desert floor, removing pebbles, leaving colored dirt exposed, drawing some sort of depictions of fauna and humanoid scribbles for only those above Earth to visually see. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is that these are giant, ancient, unknown drawings you can only accurately depict from space or from like drones hundreds of miles in the air. In the years leading up to 2020, between 80 and 100 new figures have been found with the use of drones and cameras since at least year 1900. Yo, who's drawing these things? And why is the mountain range just so perfectly square and flat like it's been laser cut to draw on? More than 70 designs are zoomorphic, including birds, spiders, fish, lizards, and of course, humans. Lots of different shapes and clothing and builds of humans. Interesting. It became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I feel like this is going to be on Art Attack. Number three, the Busby Stoop Chair. The Busby Stoop Chair comes from 1702. So right off the bat, this legend kicked off only 10 years after the Salem Witch Trials. So take this one with a grain of salt, please. People made odd choices at this time. They kind of believed anything, you know, women were witches, chairs were haunted. Welcome to 1702, I guess. Englishman Thomas Busby had some issues with his father-in-law. He didn't handle those issues well and he had to be hanged for it. Yeah, you can't just kill people for no reason, Thomas. What is it, 1701? That's crazy. He was hanged near the Humble Inn, ironic name, but a chair that was nearby during said hanging is now said to hold the spirit of one Thomas Busby. So legend has it, if you sit on this chair or if you put your knee on it or whatever, you are set to die in a frightful accident. A frightful accident! Big chair, could you imagine? You sat in that chair, now you're gonna your pants at work. No! <laughs> That's it. God forbid you needed to tie your shoelace at the Humble Inn. Uh, the horrors! The horrors. So the chair was declared haunted. The chair was declared haunted. But did anything actually happen afterwards? Yeah, honestly. Sounds silly, but this was the real deal, I guess. Locals say during World War II, airmen from a nearby base came to the pub, and those who sat in the Busby chair have never returned. Again, could have had something to do with the war, but let's continue. Then in the late 70s, more accidents were connected, but they still kept the chair around until 1798. They're like, eh, it's haunted, but it looks nice, you know? It matches the wall. It stayed at the inn for that long, and then it was donated to the Thirsk Museum. So if you feel like checking out some haunted chairs, there you go, freaks. Number two, Gobekli Tepe. This mysterious ancient site in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey is dated between 1000 and 12,000 BCE. The site comprises of a number of large man-made structures supported by massive stone megalithic pillars. Gobekli Tepe, or known simply as Potbelly Hill, is the oldest place of which megaliths were mounted. The oldest, like 
ever and most confusing. Pillars richly decorated with promorphic details, clothing, wild animals, fauna, star systems. Archaeologists are puzzled to say the least. Famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt views Gobekli Tepe as a Stone Age sanctuary. Radiocarbon dating indicates that it contains the oldest known ruins that holster butchered bones of not only deer, but pigs, birds, geese, fish. They've been identified as cooked food prepared for large groups as festivals or feasts. Yeah, they don't really know exactly what this place was used for, but after finding all this academia and scientific knowledge, it's certain that this place was used by scholars of high order to either teach or study the skills of masonry, as well as the cosmos. And it's only been about a tenth discovered so far. Yeah, just about one tenth. Who knows what other secrets Quebecly Tepe has to unveil? Let's get those other nine tenths uh, undug, no? And the number one spot, ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest ancient Greek shipwreck ever discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. This ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel. Not huge, but somehow, this ship has been kept in almost perfect condition for over 2,400 years, a mile below the sea surface. The lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship, and that's why it looked like it sank last year, not thousands of years. Ago. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed with his own eyes in his lifetime. This discovery changed what we know about ships in the ancient world. It is to date the oldest intact shipwreck ever known to mankind. It can't be beat. This thing is older than most curses. I say pull it up, slap some paint on her, get her going again, no? Quality versus quantity back then? Things were just built to last back then. History. Number 10. Gold Tongues. 140 miles south of Cairo is El Banasa. Archaeologists just found two sealed tombs containing the remains of a mystery man and a mystery woman, and an array of clues, and of course, treasures. The sealed tomb and sarcophagi made of limestone included scarab amulets, four canopic mummy jars, and more than 400 pieces of pottery and funerary figurines. Yeah, like little guys. The mummy's face was also so well preserved with a perfectly shiny golden tongue still inside his mouth. Ooh, ouch. They just like dip that in or they cut that off and kind of replace it. How's that work? Guy's gonna have a hard time with his L's. The team stumbled upon three golden tongues actually, and archaeologists working in the Alexandria also also discovered gold tongue mummies dating to about 2,000 years ago. Talk about an expensive sentence, huh? Number nine, ginger. As always, if you like what we do here on Bumblebee, throw us a like button, why don't you? Or comment down below. Which one of these creep you out the most? The golden tongues? Dude. It's already got me. The Ghiblian pre-dynastic mummies are six naturally mummified bodies dating to approximately 3400 BCE, or from the late pre-dynastic period of ancient Egypt. Since 1901, the first body excavated has remained on display in the British Museum. The body, of course, was originally nicknamed Ginger due to its very well-preserved, healthy, shiny red hair. This nickname is no longer officially used, of course, because these are people we're talking about here. After the Human Tissue Act of 2004, the British Museum developed policies for proper treatment of human remains, and no longer used nicknames. Ah, yeah, that would have been nice, wouldn't it? Just finding bones making jokes. Ah, yes, look, Limbs McGee. <laughs> I'll, I'll write that down. I'll write that down in here as the official. These six were excavated at the end of the 19th century by Wallace Budge and are the first complete, fully intact pre-dynastic bodies ever discovered to this day. Spooky. Number eight. King Tut. We can't just blow by this list without the scariest event of all. The tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings, led by Egyptologist Howard Carter. Tut's tomb was hidden by debris, luckily, therefore it never got looted throughout the centuries. More than 5,000 objects were found, including the infamous King Tut himself. Egypt, now part of the British rule, gave a feeling of national pride back then, strengthening pharaonism and gluing Egypt's ties to this now ancient world. The publicity, surrounding the excavation intensified when one of the founders actually died of an infection, giving rise to the infamous cursed tomb. But then a couple of other discoverers just started dropping dead and everyone was like, oh yeah, yeah, so that's what cursed means, huh? It says, do not open right here. I see that now, gotcha. Number seven, the Codex Gigas. Basically translates to giant book, Codex Gigas. And it's giant, 170 pounds. It's the largest medieval manuscript in the world. Also known as the Devil's Bible. Yeah, due to the highly detailed full page portrait of Satan himself, the demonology written within and the legend around it initial creation. Made out of 180 donkeys, the famous myth is that a scribe traded his soul to the Prince of Darkness so that he could complete and master the contents of the universe written within this one book. Comprised in only 
one night. Created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine Monastery of Bohemia, now modern day Czech Republic, this book's creepy. Yeah, it contains the complete Bible, like the Old One and the New Testament, as well as everything medicinal and cosmological that a human would know at Earth at that time. All written in Latin, and of course predated glyphs, and of course missing the last 10 pages of the book. Yep, ripped out and missing. I don't know. Who knows? The book lays in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm. I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't read it. I wouldn't even touch it. You know, I'm good with goosebumps. That scares me enough. Number six, Nikostratos. A large unknown Greco-Roman tomb was just found this year and excavated in Aswan in South Egypt. An Egyptian Italian mission led by Patrizia Piacentini, professor of Egyptology and archeology span at the University of Milan. What makes this discovery so cool is the mummies that were discovered. This massive Romanized tomb located in the Aga Khan Mausoleum, found archaeological treasures including offering tables, stone panels littered in hieroglyphics, and one large beautiful copper necklace engraved in Greek scripture with the name Nicostratus on it. The room is overlooked by four burial chambers dug deep into the rock where a beautiful terracotta sarcophagus lay. The architecture alone is puzzling, let alone these mysterious high order young adults that were mummified here. Early studies have indicated so far that the grave includes bodies from more than one family, so the mystery question. Who was this Nicostratus? Who was he? And who are these unrelated followers that followed him? Number five. The Hope Diamond. Coming from the 1660s, this curse began when a gem dealer named Jean-Baptiste Tavernier bought this large diamond when visiting India. He bought it with his, with his earned money, with his money, okay? Remember that. The origins of the diamond were unknown, but it didn't matter. This beauty was just sitting there and he had to throw all the cash at it. He had to buy it with all of his money. For sure, the money that he had. Well, later on, after Tavernier got the diamond, rumors spread throughout Europe and the United States that he actually stole the diamond from the statue of a Hindu goddess. He didn't actually buy it. Yeah, a little different than his story. Sadly, more believable too. The newspapers actually kicked this one off by publishing the Hope Diamond as an ancient curse. The diamond at one point ended up in the hands of King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Well, if you don't know about them, they were, uh, they lost their, you know, they died. They lost their lives during the French Revolution, let's just say that, the old guillotine dream team. The stone then went to Lord Francis Hope come 1839. By that point, it was deemed cursed for real, hence the Hope Diamond name. They ended up selling the diamond shortly after being reduced to poverty, and then Evelyn Walsh McLean bought the stone in 1912. Shortly after, her son was killed in a car accident, and when the stone was delivered to its final and current home, the Smithsonian, back in 1958, the driver delivering the package was later hit by a truck. He survived, but shortly after this, his house caught fire. Moral of the story, you don't need diamonds for more reasons than one. Number four, the Lady of Cal. Speaking of being tatted head to toe for reasons we're still unsure of, the Lady of Cal. She was discovered in 2006 by a team of Peruvian archeologists in the El Brujo archeological complex in Northern Peru led by Regulo Franco Jordan, one of the National Cultural Institute of Peru. The mummy, which is heavily tattooed head to toe and wrapped in many layers of cloth, was found with a ton of ceremonial items, pottery, weapons, and jewelry. The remains of a second young woman were found as well, and researchers think it could have been a sacrifice, signifying this woman was a ruler of many. Modern autopsy reveals that they were in their mid-20s and died of complications due to pregnancy. They think she died somewhere around 450 BCE, and until they found her, researchers were almost certain that only men held high standing in their culture and power, and that women of this status should never have existed. Well, rewrite them, boys, because Beyonce said it. Who run the world? Girls. Boom, right there. Evidence, sacrifice, tattoos, come on. Number three, the mother of dragons. Mary Anning was an English fossil collector, dealer, and paleontologist who became famously known around the world for her discoveries in Jurassic marine fossil beds in the cliffs along the English Channel at Lyme Regis in Southwest England. I'm not talking about finding a tooth or something. She found three species of dinosaurs, like three different species of dinosaur. Anning's findings contributed to a massive scientific research, pushing prehistoric academia towards the future. In 1811, when Mary was only 12, she found a bizarre fossilized skull. Mary then searched for and dug the outline of its 5.2 meter long skeleton, and by the time she was done, everyone in the town knew that she had discovered something important. Scientists thought this was some sort of ancient crocodile. People were puzzled. Ten years later, she discovers a completely new skeleton of plesiosaur. Two years later, she found one with wings. Today, the Natural History Museum in London showcases several of Mary Anning's historic finds, including her ichthyosaurus, plesiosaur, 
and Pterosaur. Dude, there needs to be like at least three movies about her on Netflix, no? Like Jurassic Park, England. Number two, Chinchoro Mummies. On the sandy dunes of the Atacama Desert, the Chilean port city of Arica, bordering Peru, was home to the Chinchoro people. In July, the United Nations Cultural Organization, UNESCO, added hundreds of well-preserved mummies to its World Heritage List. The Chinchoro Mummies. First documented in 1917 by German archaeologist Max Yule, who had found some of the preserved bodies actually on a beach. Radiocarbon dating eventually showed that the mummies were more than 7,000 years old, more than two millennia older than the more widely known Egyptian mummies. The earliest one, the Achaman, dates to 7020 BCE. They discovered their process of three stages. The black technique was to take the deceased person's body apart, limb by limb, treating it and then reassembling it all in like a Mr. Potato Head style. Then the red technique, which made incisions above the shoulders to remove all internal organs and dry the body out. And finally, the mud coat. Basically caking the body in a mixture of clay and gypsum in a last coat seal. Then they'd wrap you up. And using sticks to mold and hold a cast of a person's shape, this process was, well, this. Researchers think that Egyptians were like, oh, that's how you do it. I see what the, okay, perfect. I'm just gonna go over there and do that. And number one, Saqqara mummies. In 2019, just 20 miles south of Cairo on the Nile's west bank, there lays a field mixed of sand and earth that make up the ancient site of Saqqara. It's the oldest building known to humans. Like old, old. Older than the three pyramids. And with that comes a new archeological discovery. This year, archeologists just discovered the largest loot of ancient Egypt ever. Better than Tut's tomb, 150 bronze statues, 250 coffins with mummies in them that date back 3,000 years. Saqqara is Egypt's richest archaeological site. Home to the 4,700 year old Step Pyramid, Egypt's oldest, the site was used as a burial ground. Geophysical surveys have revealed the remains of numerous temples buried under the sand in which we have discovered only a quarter of the actual site. Millions of animal mummies like dogs, cats, cobras, and crocs, even two lion cubs were found mummified. The work site is 500 yards long and the archaeologists working there have only carried out the first 100 yards of digging. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not gonna lie. I can't wait to see like what next year holds. Like, get some more bulldozers going, you know? Saqqara, Gobekli Tepe, Peru. More scans, more scans. So interesting, but also very terrifying. Number 10, the Anguish Man. I don't care who you are, but every family out there has one artifact or one heirloom in their house that just doesn't sit well with you. Please comment below and let us know. I'm actually very curious to see what it is. For me, it was a dancing Halloween skull with Moss and black roses coming out of its eyes, playing the classic funeral song. I don't know what you call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Speaking of funerals, that's probably where the Anguish Man came from. I'm just taking a guess. The Anguish Man is a painting of a man in anguish, or some sort of distress, and I'm not just saying this to be funny, but the painting is 100% bona fide scary. What's more unusual than that is that no one is sure of its origin or creator. The current owner of the painting says he got it from his grandmother. And the knowledge train stops there. No one knows where it came from. But seriously, look at it. It's scary. It's terrifying. I don't like it. I'm gonna walk off now. I'm scared. Number nine, the goddess of death statue. Well, that's quite the name. Okay, let's talk about it, shall we? For starters, it doesn't look like anything menacing, which makes the tail that much more convincing, if anything. It looks like one of those crazy bones. Remember crazy bones from the late 90s? So good. I had all of them. Put them in my mouth all the time, weirdly. It's like the suck on some crazy bones. This cursed ancient statue from 3500 BC was unearthed at Lempa, Cyprus back in 1878. The limestone was dated quite a while back and the statue, as far as origins go, is a complete mystery. But many historians believe that it was once a fertility statue or it represented a goddess whose name has now been lost in time. The statue has gone through numerous families with tragedy following closely behind. Hence the, you know, curse aspect of his list. Lord Elephant had the statue for around six years and during that time, all seven of his family members bit the bullet. Second owner, Ivor Minucci, same thing, entire family just wiped out, this time only within four years. Lord Thompson Noel, entire family, also four years. And then finally the statue had belonged to the late Sir Alan Biverbrook and his family. And you can probably guess what happened within a few years. Number eight, cursed amethyst. A beautiful purple amethyst stolen from India. Worth a fortune and would make an excellent addition to any jewelry collection. Trouble is, there may be something wrong with this gorgeous gem. Cursed, that is. The first gentleman to appropriate this gem quickly became ill afterwards and passed away. The gem was then given to his son, who also became ill 
and croaked. The gem kept passing hands as the story goes on, until it came to the possession of a man named Edward Heron Allen, who was so convinced of the gem's dark powers, he stored it in a bank vault and put it in seven lockboxes, just to make sure. It's kind of like the babushka doll from hell. He also left strict instructions to take out the gem 33 years exactly to the day that he put it in, and a warning for anyone who dares possess such an item. It now sits in the Museum of Natural History. I'll keep my distance, thank you very much. Number seven, John Wilkes Booth. Okay, so mummies are usually tied with Egyptian ritual and historical burial purposes, but it wasn't just them though. It's pretty common to preserve a body. John Wilkes Booth was famous for a couple of things. First off, he was one of the world's greatest actors. A true thespian, and of course, a prolific American presidential assassin. Yeah, he shot Lincoln, so. Apparently, he escaped the manhunt, which then apparently toured the US as a mummified version of himself. Wait, what? In 1903, a drifter named David E. George locked himself in a hotel, taking his own life by ingesting a lethal amount of arsenic. According to the news report, George made a confession. I am not David E. George. I am the one who killed the best man that ever lived. I am John Wilkes Booth. The embalmed body was soon fought over and beginning in 1937 and continuing all the way into the 1950s, the mummy was part of Jay Gould's million dollar circus. Yeah, traveling with elephants, acrobats, and high dive dog acts all around the world. According to a PBS report, the mummy itself was actually last seen in the 1970s and maybe in the hands of a private collector. Dude. People are sick. They'll buy and sell literally anything for money and clout. Like, I don't get it, dude. Just like, buy and sell Pokemon cards or something, you know? Number six, The Crying Boy. Another painting, I know, but this one is extra creepy. So basically, there's this very popular print of a painting. It's a boy, he's crying. Oh, I know, who would want that though, seriously? There's different versions of it, but originally done by Bruno Armilio. Well, we don't talk about Bruno because his painting had some serious creep factor going on. Besides the fact that it's a crying young man who's peering into the very depths of your soul, firefighters began to notice a pattern when putting out house fires. There's a connection here, hold on, stay tuned. No smoke alarms, leaving the stove unattended, and this painting were common. I wonder why, except the painting was never damaged in any of these fires. And after putting out a few houses, and the same painting keeps showing up and keeps surviving the said fires, that's strange, hmm, that's weird. As it turns out, the print had flame retardant chemicals in its production, thus protecting it. Maybe just don't bring it inside though. Number five, the Voynich Manuscript. There's a giant Italian Renaissance folio called the Voynich Manuscript. It's named after Wilfred Voynich, a book dealer who purchased it in 1912, and to this day, we don't really know what it is. Hands down, the most mysterious book of all time. Not only is it detailed so carefully and patiently, it's basically like a Tim Burton take on a book about life, with an entire world drawn and recorded that isn't ours. Like, parallel universe type stuff. Even the language is unknown, like unknown, unknown, like predates Latin and doesn't use phonetic patterns and coding. The riddle of all riddles. Written somewhere between 1405 and 1450, all 240 pages are inscribed in some sort of indecipherable language of about 170,000 characters. Historians and cartographers have tried to crack the code for hundreds of years, yet not one has been successful. Why wasn't this a national treasure movie? I feel like this would have been perfect, like Nicolas Cage, you know? I don't know. Number four, crude oil. Before anyone jumps all over me and says, but Chetty, I love crude oil because it provides jobs and economy. That's true, you're right, and there's probably gonna be someone else saying that without crude oil and gasoline, how can they keep up their lifestyle? I need gas for my sedan, pickup truck, SUV, RV, dirt bike, quad bike, go-kart, speedboat, my John Deere, lawn equipment. All this is true, and as a big dude, I appreciate the automobile just as much as the next guy. I ain't walking. However, one cannot deny the amount of trouble oil has caused folks in the last 100 years. Name a place with oil and there's probably someone foaming at the mouth trying to get their hands on it. You can go either way on this one really. All I know is that I'm not the emperor of an evil empire looking for oil. Or am I? Number three, Killer Crocs. In 1899, archaeologists funded by the University of California benefactor Phoebe A. Hurst found hundreds of crocodile mummies on an expedition to northern Egypt. 19 mummified crocodiles are part of the Egyptian collection at the Phoebe A. Hurst Museum of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. These things were a constant threat to ancient Egyptians, and there were a lot of them. Some tomb walls are even decorated head to toe with scenes that show herdsmen performing magical spells to ward off crocodiles before they cross the Nile on wooden boats. It was such a big 
problem every August when the Nile would flood that there were croc priests who would spend all day mummifying and offering them to the gods. Apparently, the Dutch National Museum of Antiques unwrapped and scanned a 3,000 year old croc mummy, which were actually 50 little crocodiles positioned in a way to make it look like a giant croc. Like a croc within a croc. And not just them, too. The cat faced goddess Bastet would receive mummified cats while baboons were offered to Thoth, the god of wisdom. Animal mummification was so popular that it became a thriving industry. In one catacomb complex, Egyptologists think there could be as many as 70 million mummified animals crammed into like 30 small rooms. Different times, man, different times. Number two, Capuchin Crypt. Hey, I get it. In the past, there were no home renovators. You couldn't walk into your favorite big box home renovation store and pick out some great additions for interior design. Well, some guys in Rome thought their church was a little underwhelming. They wanted something that made a statement, something bold, something macabre. The Church of Santa Maria in Rome, and it has a longer name, but it's not dyslexia friendly, so I'm not going to pronounce it, is a church that's decorated with skulls and bones arranged in tasteful art pieces, lining the walls and archways with bones that look like designs, and one room having some mummified monks and a wall full of skulls to comfort churchgoers. Oh, God. I can just imagine what a room full of old bones smells like. Oh, no thank you. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Oh. And hey, number one, the Great Bed of Ware. Yeah, let's get nice and cozy for this last one. When putting this list together, Big Chet and I both agreed that Haunted or Not, this is a bed we would both have, for sure. It's massive, it's cozy, it caught our eye. It looks like a bed a king would sleep in, and rightfully so. The Great Bed of Ware was built for the royal family back in 1463. It was 12 feet by 12 feet, plenty of space to cut your toenails, whatever you want to do. Yeah, just brush them off. You got like 11 more feet to work with. You're good. It's a big bed. What a time. Jonas Fosbrook, a carpenter from the time, impressed King Edward IV with his work. The king gave him a pension for life all because of this bed. That's how good it was. Over time, the bed became property of the Lord of Ware Manor, a man named Thomas Fanshawe. People would travel all across the land to see this beauty. That's a fun family vacation. Hey, let's go see this bed. I heard it's a neat bed. Pack your stuff. Shakespeare mentioned it in the Twelfth Night, it was a big deal, but all those who stayed in the bed did not have a good night's rest. Rather, they woke up to scratches and bruises, it was horrible. That is, if they got enough sleep to begin with. People would wake up on the floor. Somehow they would roll out of a 12-foot bed. That's crazy. Today it can be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum, so if you want to go cuddle up, there you go.